Okay, thank you. Uh, I think that we can uh, proceed to the next uh, uh, session, which is a, a really very interesting session uh, with two um, uh, very uh, well-known and uh, pronounced uh, speakers. Um, I have to introduce my co-chair, uh, Dr. Tsiahris. Uh, uh, my the first speaker is um, Kim Rajapan, who is a consultant in uh, Oxford University, a very old friend of uh, of mine. Kim, it's a it's a real pleasure for us to 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 have you with uh, with us uh, one more time. Um, Kim is uh, uh, one of the most uh, pronounced figures in. Uh, uh, UK electrophysiology, but uh, above all, he's a very good uh, friend. He's uh, always prone to share with us uh, all the new knowledge, and uh, we are really grateful that uh, he is with us uh, today. Him, uh, it's uh, your turn. Nikos, uh, Dr. Rakes, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be with you all, and. Uh, Thank you for inviting me to speak again. I'm just sorry I can't be in lovely Thessaloniki with you, um, but hopefully sometime in the not too distant future. Um, I'm here in actually surprisingly sunny Oxford in the UK. And uh, thank you so much for those kind words, uh, Nikos. You're a great friend and also a great electrophysiologist, and I respect you deeply. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with my talk. Uh, mapping and ablation of difficult arrhythmias, an epicide approach. I don't have any particular disclosures for this, this talk. As Nikos said, I'm, I'm one of a number of electrophysiologists in the UK, and increasingly all of us are in some way or another performing epicardial procedures, or certainly the vast majority. In Oxford, we probably perform about 25 to 30 of these a year, maybe slightly more, um, but it does sort of come in waves. We might do three or four in a month, and then maybe only one the next month. I'll move on. Sorry. So I'm just going to start very briefly with a case, if I may, just for, just for five minutes or so, just to set the scene. I, I saw some very nice images from the previous speaker. I'm sorry I couldn't understand the Greek. My Greek is clearly non-existent. Your English is all excellent. But uh, I, I saw some nice pictures, uh, particularly some epicardial ones. This is a pretty typical patient that we see with uh, a relatively elderly gentleman, a remote history of myocardial infarction in the 90s multiple coronary interventions over a period of time but ultimately despite some further anginal symptoms he has no further coronary intervention required and we then didn't see him for quite a long period of time until last year in may when he was admitted to one of our other hospitals referring to us with chest pain and a broad complex tachycardia uh, and i know i'm speaking to a, a very educated audience so uh, that's what i love about uh, speak at this meeting and so I, I don't need to say too much about this ECG to you all other than to confirm that of course it is a broad complex tachycardia most likely to be VT the sort of so-called reverse rabbit's ear or sort of the large R small uh, S and then small R um, in the uh, precordial leads here it's got a superior axis which would fit with his previous sort of inferolateral scar it's quite broad. Um, given the title of my talk, it's not the most slurred ECG I've seen, but it's quite broad. And I think that's one of the points I'd just make here for those who don't already do epicardial ablation. Um, it, it is something that you have to be alert to because it's not always classical on the ECG, although there are some features on this ECG that are suggestive, slight slurring of the upstroke. And so he was hemodynamically stable, actually, with this. He, he actually walked into hospital. Uh, he was given some IV amiodarone, although before they did that, our team have all been told, please give some adenosine just to make sure you're not missing an SVT with aberrant scene. In this case, as I said, there's some features that very much make it more likely to be VT, including the history. And the adenosine did nothing other than, unfortunately, drop his blood pressure. Uh, so he ended up having a fairly urgent cardioversion. And this is his post cardioversion ECG, nothing too remarkable there, sinus rhythm with evidence of perhaps his old uh, infarct. His troponin initially wasn't that high, um, a few thousand almost, 
His echo actually showed that his ejection fraction was reasonable. It wasn't severely impaired. There were some regional wall motion abnormalities, as one would expect. He was initially given a few days of amiodrone by the, the team that were looking after him, and then that was stopped, and he was just left on a beta block. And he was transferred to our hospital in Oxford. That's the John Radcliffe Hospital. And we did another angiogram, found some moderate circumflex disease, repeated his echocardiogram, actually found his ejection fraction was almost normal. So we now have this gentleman who's had hemodynamically tolerated VT in the setting of ischemic heart disease with a reasonable LV. It, in previous times when I've given this talk, I've sort of asked what the audience would do, and I might ask the chairs in, in the question session what they would do, but we discharged him on medical treatment at that stage, um, but he very quickly came back with the same morphology, palpitations again, again, hemodynamically stable, and actually here's the ECG, and it's, it, it's the same ECG uh, uh, again at the referring hospital, and so he was transferred across to us again after being cardioverted, and again with a slight impairment of his ventricular function. And at this point, we decided that we didn't want to put an ICD in him. And I think that would be interesting to discuss as well, perhaps in our questioning. But because it was hemodynamic tolerated, reasonable LV, we were going to ablate this recurrent VT despite being on beta blocker. We chose not to just put him on amiodrone and leave him on amiodrone. And in the cath lab, actually, we took him in and it was very easy to induce the VT. You can see here a, a drive train uh, with a, a single extra stimulus. Uh, and then initiating the VT. And when we look at the VT, this is it, uh, it's 12 lead. And when we compare that up in the top left corner uh, to the clinical VT down in the bottom right corner, we can see it's, it's very similar. We, we believe the same VT that we induced. Now, I think with ischemic heart disease, we, we could terminate it with ATP reproducibly, and that was quite useful for us to know in case we thought we were going to have to go ahead and put an ICD. Um, but with, with ischemic VT, we, we would always, and indeed the recommendations I'll be talking about, consensus statements in a moment, would always be to try an endocardial ablation first. So we did this through a retrograde approach. Um, we actually took a, a single ablation catheter. I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. We didn't decide to do an extensive map. He, he had the VT. We took a, a single ablation catheter and did some retrograde mapping. Um, and we, we could not find anything early antigradely. This is the earliest signal we found was probably just around the onset of, of the QRS at some points, and we could find nothing early at all. And at that point, I think as an operator, you have to make a decision. Are, are you going to carry on and look epicardy, having found nothing endocardially, or, or are you going to bring him back again? Now, we've obviously anticoagulated him at this stage. We have traditionally done uh, epicardial punctures with full anticoagulation with heparin, having done the endocardial approach first. In this case, because we'd done no endocardial ablation, we felt it was very reasonable to just reverse the heparin. And most guidelines would say reverse the heparin and then do your epicardial puncture. Uh, I saw, yes, the previous speaker just talking about an epicardial map. For those of you who haven't done an epicardial uh, procedure, I was very fortunate um, many about 15 years ago or so to be trained by uh, the team at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London uh, to do epicardial procedures. And indeed, when I came to Oxford, we started the epicardial program. Uh, and it is definitely something that all of you as electrophysiologists are more than capable of doing. Um, it is recommended that it's done in a surgical center because there are potential complications. But I know a lot of people do their EP in a surgical center anyway. Unfortunately, as electrophysiologists, we get a certain number of tamponades. I hope not too many, but we do. And so you know, we're used to pericarditis so this is a technique that you can all do. It just needs a bit of practice. And, and this is an LAO view. You can see the quadrupolar catheter marking the RV apex in this patient. And you can see the epicardial needle just at the bottom of the screen coming in and heading sort of posteriorly. We mostly take a fairly posterior approach. I'll talk about that in a moment. And what you actually feel with the needle, really, I, I do this with my trainees. I'd get them to do them with me. I try and talk them and try and get them to really concentrate what they're feeling. You feel the needle moving through tissue. And then the first thing you feel as a stiff resistance is normally actually the, the sort of subdiaphragmatic layer and the diaphragm itself is, as you're sort of heading through that bit of tissue. That's the first bit of stiffness. Now, we use a little bit of contrast. 
can I emphasize it's really important to keep the contrast that you use very minimal because it will stain and if it stains it completely you actually can't see anything at all so it's literally 0 0.2 0 0.3 of a mil of injection of contrast and if it stains and is not flowing around the pericardium don't put any more in and actually what you find is that you can actually stain the tissue a bit like we you can some people do for their transeptal punctures we don't but you can stain this bit of tissue and you can see it tenting and then as it gives you actually feel it give and then if you inject your contrast you see what you see here on this image which is the contrast washing very nicely around the pericardial space you can then insert your wire and we can see the wire going in here and it's going right up out past the, the top edge of the cardiac silhouette. Uh, in fact, I normally push it in and really wrap it all the way around, both over to the right and the left side to demonstrate that it, it's going all the way around the pericardium. If you see ventricular ectopy at any of these stages, you know you might have entered uh, the ventricular chamber, most commonly the right ventricle. A right ventricular puncture is quite common in my experience, I'm afraid to say it, it does happen. Um, there are various techniques that have been described to try and help with this. One of my colleagues in UK actually perforates the coronary sinus deliberately and injects a little bit of CO2 into the pericardial space to make a bit of a space. I, I personally think that probably isn't necessary in most instances. And then once that's in, you can then feed a uh, sheath into the epicardial space. And now with the Abbott or St. Jude Epigillus epicardial, you have a steerable sheath that you can use in the epicardial space, which has made life a lot easier. And this particular patient, as soon as we're in the epicardial space, we land nicely on this little signal here um, in sinus rhythm, very late potential, as you can see. Um, and we induced VT, and we can see that the potentials are sitting nicely here in the sort of earlier part of mid diastole, very nice again. Um, we could perfectly entrain the VT from here with quite a long stim to, to QRS. So we're probably in the earlier part of the, the diastolic pathway. Um, and at this point, we, we felt there wasn't much point in just doing a lot more small mapping. So we actually got on, before we ablate, we do a coronary angiogram. This is the location of the ablation catheter here. And uh, we do a quick coronary angiogram just to make sure that we're ideally at least one centimeter away from any larger epicardial coronary artery. I don't think you can avoid the very, very tiny branches always. Um, and here we go, we can see from the right side, we're, we're far enough away. And actually within a few seconds of delivering RF, we terminate the VT uh, and, and of course render him for that VT at least clinically non-inducible. Uh, we do always now go on and perform a full substrate map and ablate the substrate as well. But I, I really just want to show that, of course, one of a, a nice example, it's not always that straightforward, but just to, sh to highlight the difference between the endocardium where we found really nothing in terms of an early signal, or anything that we thought we could target for ablation and a very clear early signal um, and appropriate signal in the epicardium very quickly. So epicardial VT ablation is the first type of epicardial ablation we do is, is, is a challenge. Um, it's often with failure of endocardial ablation and therefore there's these epicardial circuits that we have to try and target. Um, one could think about using the coronary sinus occasionally for, for some of these targets, but that's pretty limited largely due to anatomy. And so this approach from Sosa, uh, largely in the Shaggers disease population originally that we were all aware of, was described now many years ago, but has really taken off uh, subsequently. And it does allow in at least patients who have a free epicardial space for us to freely map virtually, you know, really the entire epicardial ventricular surface, both right and left ventricular. Uh, it's been described in all sorts of VTs, both ischemic and non-ischemic, and indeed in post-cardiac surgery. Our own experience in the post-cardiac surgery patients is that occasionally you will find a patient who you can get into the space percutaneously and actually move quite freely, uh, quite surprisingly, even though theoretically they've had a cardiotomy. There are, however, a number of patients that we've done where we couldn't get very far, in fact, you know, literally millimeters from the puncture site. It's quite clear it's firmly fibrosed, and heased. Um, we've used surgeons to help us. And I always thought the surgeons would just open it all up for us with a sub -zifoid sort of little window, but actually that's not the case at all. They struggle to open up as well. It's very adhesed. And they sort of say to me, look, Kim, we, we can't blindly start you know, stripping the, the adhesion. So you know, it's not always that the surgeons can help you from a little sub approach either.
Uh, and yeah, there are some people who post post a initial epicardial procedure get a lot of pericarditis, and then that actually causes adhesions, which limits a second procedure. We tend to do almost all of ours under general anaesthetic. We have done some of them under sedation, heavy sedation, but we tend to do them mostly under general anaesthetic just because of the patient, their stability, and also it is painful quite a lot for the, for the patients. Um, as I said, ideally it's performed before any anticoagulation. So that just leads me to say, when do we do it in terms of, do we do it for all our patients having VT ablation? That's not the case. I'll talk about some of the, again, the consensus statement guidelines in a moment, but generally in our practice, there are certain patients we will at the start get access in the femoral vein, the femoral artery and the epicardial space before any anticoagulation is given, uh, just so that we know we're ready to go. And I'll talk about that in a moment. We tend to use this TUI needle. It's a really neat needle. We've been using it here for about the last 10 years. Um, it's, this is the needle itself. It's a spinal anesthetic needle um, and it looks very so it just has this little beveled end at the end edge and I don't know whether you hopefully you can see that but essentially what that means is when the guide wire comes out rather than coming straight out of the end it actually comes out and heads upwards this way so if you keep the bevel away from the epicardial surface of the heart then when the wire comes out it won't go into the myocardium but actually just hit the uh, parietal pericardium not not the um not the sort of uh part that's nearer to the to the heart itself and it's it's really neat and you you do need an, an extra long one though so if you just go to your anesthetist and ask for them they'll give you their standard one which is normally too short there's a there's a longer version that we use i definitely recommend that if you're going to start doing these it, it does make it easier um the puncturing is in a fairly standard sort of pericardiocentesis position i would describe it as i've given some landmarks there and though I say you aim for the left shoulder, it's a little bit more midline, I would say, than a standard pericardiocentesis approach you'll find. There, there is the, the sensation that you can get more anterior if you go more horizontally uh, to the to this chest and a bit more vertically for posterior. I have to say largely we end up a bit more vertical and posterior, but with now a steerable sheath, it's relatively easy to steer around to the anterior space, even if you entered more posteriorly. And this is done under fluoroscopic guidance. As I said, you 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 get a feel for this and I can only suggest that if you're going to do these if you haven't already done them um, that you, you get someone to come and just just mentor you for, for a few of them you don't need too many small amounts of contrast I've already mentioned I've mentioned the steerable sheath we you can use um, negative pressure on this on the sheath to try and keep fluid coming out we have occasionally where we've had quite a lot of bleeding occur auto transfused or taken the blood out and cell saved it it has to go into a heparinized bag there is a, a myocarditis and a, and a sort of pericarditis instance, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But as I've said here, once you're in the in the space, it's actually pretty conventional to map. And indeed, I think the previous speaker sort of showed the grid being used, the HD grid from Abbott being used. We've used virtually every catheter that you can think of in the epicardial space to map. One thing that is important is that epicardial fat or pericardial fat does make a difference in terms of both pacing threshold and also ablation it is difficult to ablate pericardial fat or epicardial fat but also very very hard to recognize that this is the original description uh, of uh, the epicardial approach and I, i'll leave it there just for a moment just to show it only but interesting that they use the tui needle for a while we just used a standard pericardial synthesis needle which you can do but it's better with the tui needle and I do think it's you know, it's absolutely mandated in all the guidelines that before you deliver your lesions, you perform coronary angiography. There are now some very neat tools that allow you to import your coronary angiogram into your 3D mapping system. I'm sorry, I didn't put a picture of that in my talk for some reason, I'm not sure why, but um, there are some very neat tools. You can also simply map it out using one of the catheters if, that, if you prefer or some people will take repeated coronary angiography, but we normally just take one and then use it to map the rest uh, of the uh, 3D map and de delineate where the coronary arteries are running. People often ask me when we when we proctor them for their uh, epicardial approaches and for their first time, you know, what sort of catheters do we use? We almost always use an open irrigated catheter. That does introduce fluid into the pericardium. So you have to remember that whilst you're ablating, you're gonna do that and cause a little degree of, of uh, tamponading. So that has to be aspirated off. A closed catheter could be used, but we tend to use an open. Powers, I think you do need to use high powers. I mean, we routinely use about 50 watts here in Oxford. 
people I know use anywhere from 30, I put 40, but 30 to 70. Um, I've certainly gone up to 60 and 70 when we've had areas where I'm not getting a result, which I think I should be getting a, a, an effect. But that probably relates, as I said earlier, to epicardial fat, and it probably doesn't matter how much power you put through that. We tend not to leave a drain in anymore routinely. If at the end of the procedure, the pericardium is dry, we've drained it and have any fluid, we normally wait for about 15 minutes, repeat the echoes. We often have a TOE probe down. And um, yeah, if there's no fluid in there after that period of time, we remove the, the sheath. Quite often, a lot of my operator cars, I think, leave a wire in just initially when they remove it. Actually, I'm quite happy just to pull it out with the ablation catheter if, if there's nothing there. If there is obviously ongoing bleeding, you may have to leave a pericardial drain in and monitor that and remove it. But the main reason removing it so quickly is because it minimizes the pericarditic pain. Uh, and we've seen that both in our, unfortunately, patients who've had um, pericardial fusion and tamponade, and also in our patients with epicardial ablation. If they do need pain relief, it's the standard ones. And I think there is a vogue to using intraepicardial steroids. Uh, people will tend to use maybe a, a milligram per kilogram of um, of, a, of prednisolone or something like that, uh, injecting or equivalent steroid hydrocortisone, something like that. But we don't always systematically do that. Actually, if it's been a very clean tap, it's not a problem. Uh, just on that note, I'll just mention not unusual to get a little bit of blood with the tap. So um, yeah, it, don't be too alarmed. Sometimes quite a lot of blood there. I say you might get a you know, a few hundred mils of blood, just keep aspirating it, it will normally settle. And if you do go into the right ventricle and come back, actually most of the time you'll be fine. And um, don't panic, if, you're in, if you get VEs, don't just pull it all straight out, actually just pull it back slowly and keep using your wire and you may find the wire just slips into the epicardial space. Well, the complications, um, of course, pericardial bleeding is, is the one that we, we see probably most often, although hopefully in a lot of cases doesn't cause a long-standing issue. There is the risk of damaging any epicardial structure, including the coronary arteries and the, and the coronary sinus. Uh, damage to the liver has been seen. We've had one patient who had a, a very unusual bit of anatomy. By doing a bit of uh, echo, uh, ultrasonography before you puncture, you can hopefully identify a, a, a channel or window where there's no obvious uh, liver tissue, although almost always it looks like there's some tissue there, but it, it's not liver tissue, it's just uh, muscular tissue or, or fibrous tissue. Um, as I said, RV puncture does occur quite a lot, but most of the time not an issue, and, and there have been fistulae described from various sites to the pericardium, but that's again pretty rare. So when do we go epicardial? Well, when an endocardial approach has failed previously and there's a suspicion from the ECG, these are some of the ECG features. And again, talking to this very educated audience, I think you'll probably know most, if not all of these. But just a reminder, it's the broad caresses, certainly over 200 milliseconds, this so-called pseudo delta wave, uh, this thing called the intrinsicoid deflection time. I don't think too many people look too much at these or the delayed maximal peak index, you know, some people calculate these. I think for me, it's it's really the appearance of the, the pseudo delta and the very broad QRS that are potentially indicators of thinking about needing an epicardial approach. This is a, another ECG of, a, of an, a young lady, actually. She was only in her teens who had a, a sort of congenital form of VT and had had multiple ablation procedures endocardially to try and get this in another institution and was referred to us. And we looked at this and looked at it and thought, oh, yeah, this looks this looks like a pseudo delta wave. You almost think it looks pre-excited, except it's not. It's definitely VT. There's dissociation of the atrial activity. And, of course, we were able to ablate that epicardially. There are other times when this definitely is of help, um, when there's both an aortic and mitral valve mechanical prosthesis. We've had one of those and we've ablated the patient epicardially. Uh, there's now lots of literature on epicardial VT ablation. And I, forgive me for not sort of putting lots of the literature in, but I think if you want to go and look at it, please do. I tried to sort of summarize it with the headlines, which are that it's now highly successful in almost all types of VT, and it is mostly done with irrigated radio frequency. There's a fairly low rate of complication, actually, even in the elderly patient. So age is not a barrier to us doing epicardial ablations. I think the real question for me remains as to whether or not you use it at your initial ablation or at a subsequent ablation after a failed endocardial approach.
I think speaking to a lot of much more expert people in the uh, in the field, like Paolo Della Bella and some of the guys in the States who are a lot of this sort of ablation, I think most of them agree that now increasingly, even for, certainly for their ischemics, it would be endocardial only first, unless there's a very high degree of suspicion from the ECG. And even for a lot of their non-ischemics, they would only go endocardial first. Um, I'd say traditionally we've tended in our non-ischemics to almost always do an epicardial approach at the first at sitting or at least get access at the first sitting as well. But we're moving a little away, apart from these specific ones that I mentioned here, ARVC, sarcoid and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where we will always effectively have an epicardial wiring at the start. And almost always nowadays we'll start with the epicardial map, but do that first and then do the endocardial map. If you do the endocardial map first, you know that we can look at the unipolar signals, of course, normally bipolar measurement, but we can change it, look at the unipolar signals and get a feel for whether or not there is potentially epicardial scar. I'll show, uh, I'll show this image here. Uh, this is taken from the uh, Heart Rhythm Society's consensus statement on VT and ventricular arrhythmia ablation uh, from last year. And, and this is a, a really nice example of a patient with ARVC, where in the top panel we see that actually endocardial in the right ventricle, very healthy voltages here. Um, but when you put the unipolar on, you see that suddenly there are large areas of red and low voltage. And when you check that actually in the epicardium with a bipolar epicardial map, you see it very closely corresponds and lots of interesting areas, late potential so clearly uh, quite important in, in other patients you can see there is an endocardial substrate as well but a much more extensive here epicardial substrate so it, useful to look at the endocardial unipolar map uh, I saw my previous uh, colleague speaker talking about sort of how these technologies improved and I, I sort of got the idea about HD wave mapping and just to show this this is an epicardial ablation that we did relatively recently actually just before the the sort of uh, pandemic and and we can see here this is the epicardial surface and this is the map without the sort of special algorithm being used to look at low voltage and, and initially you don't really see anything there you just see some low voltage coming down this anterior part of the of the sort of, sort of interventricular groove effectively but then when you look here and use the other algorithms, so-called HD wave, you see there is a nice little channel here. We could actually induce a BT that was going around and back through this channel and we're able to ablate this and, and close it. So technology is definitely helping a great deal with epicardial ablation. So this is the consensus statement. I think if any of you are interested in, it's probably the most up-to-date one and does have a little bit of guidance on epicardial work. I, I hope this shows at your end, but it, the, the top part of this panel talks about recommendations for epicardial access for catheter ablation. It, it talks about imaging of the epicardial coronary arteries being mandatory. Uh, it mentions that there should be immediate access to echocardiography, blood transfusion, I said cardiac surgical backup. I think, I think certainly the two first are absolutely important. It also says that you have to carefully assess the risk and benefit of a percutaneous approach versus a surgical. Uh, dissection. I think for most patients, it's going to be percutaneous. It's only if they've had a previous ablation or previous surgery where you might have to think about the possibility of adhesions. And, and importantly, one of the complications I didn't mention previously is damage to the phrenic nerve, both both left, but we're well, right, but particularly left. Um, you do need to carefully pace out uh, if you're particularly on the lateral side of the LV to make sure you're not actually inadvertently ablating the phrenic nerve whilst ablating a lateral scar. It's interesting that actually this consensus statement, and don't forget this is a consensus statement, it's very hard to make a, a sort of robust sort of clinical statement with based on randomized data. You can see the level of evidence here, recommendation of catheter ablation of ventricular arrhythmias in ischemic heart disease and the recommendation to do this epicardially here, um, actually not at the first procedure, probably at the second procedure normally, um, but level of evidence 2B, so it's, it's not very high. But I think that fits with what most people are doing who are doing a lot of this. Whereas if you look at the non-ischemics, the uh, recommendation here is that it could be useful after failure and endocardial ablation or at the initial ablation approach where there's a suspicion. And I think suspicion could just simply be that the substrate ARVC sarcoid means that you feel that there's a higher likelihood of an epicardial target. What other epicardial ablations do we do? Um, just for the last uh, 
sort of five, ten minutes, if I may. Um, this is one that, in fact, I went to Kuwait to help my friends with there. This is a young man who has uh, Brugada syndrome and received multiple shocks from his um, subcutaneous ICD. And he didn't seem to have a, a sort of VE triggering his VF. It would just be sudden onset VF often. And this has now been described. We've done about four of these in total. Um, and this this is a, is the sort of the lateral side of his right ventricle I'm showing here. Uh, and and we, we find an area here of unusually sort of slightly sometimes late but sometimes not just late but just i don't i don't know you can see down the bottom down the bottom they're fragmented electrograms um the rest of the ventricle often looks quite healthy here but you you find these areas of low voltage sort of low low frequency uh, sorry high frequency fractionated but lower voltage electrograms and and described to, to try and ablate those and and we've ablated those and what's normally done is you, you administer we administer agmaline to sort of increase the uh, degree of brigada appearance on the ecg do the ablation and then do that again once we've ablated uh, here you can see we've, we've done some ablation there and unfortunately i in q8 they didn't have flecainide or agmaline so um and i unfortunately had not been able to bring any with me because uh, i didn't know they didn't have it so we we did it without but but what you see here is this sort of this is the sort of pattern on the ecg here's v1 and v2 um and not particularly type one pattern although a suggestion of it and when you start ablating you do get quite a lot of this sort of change uh which you might just say is just sort of epicardial damage but it, it does look more like a sort of coved type one pattern and then as you finish ablating it all starts to settle and in fact you you lose the uh brigada sort of type pattern you lose the, the sort of r prime so to speak and end up with just an rs appearance in v1 and v2 and it, it's quite a nice endpoint and as i said you you then normally give agony to demonstrate that you don't get the type one pattern back again unfortunately we come with him but he's done very well I, I went there at the end of last year and i've heard he's had no more therapy at all uh which is great and he's not on he's not even on quinidine now which is what he was on for a while and as I said, this this approach is well described, described here by a you know, very eminent group of individuals who, who, who really looked at this in larger numbers. They looked at uh, 14 patients. They successfully ablated them all with that approach, as I've described it. Largely, the areas that you find that you need to ablate are the, the lower lateral part of the right ventricular outflow tract and the lateral uh, sort of more basal part of the right ventricle. That's some of the ones we've seen, and that seems to be the description as well. Um, and actually, in their patient population, there was no therapy from their ICDs at follow-up, admittedly only five months, and they repeated their flecainide challenges in this case, and even at five months, there was a negative flecainide challenge. So if you've got someone who's in trouble with their Brigada, VT storming, uh, VF storming, uh, and it's not an obvious trigger from a VE, this is definitely something to consider. Uh, and finally, uh, last other epicardial ablations from my point of view, well, a little bit of atrial ablation as well. This is just one uh, paper that summarizes quite a nice experience of almost 60 patients with recurrent AT and AF despite robust pulmonary vein isolation. What I'm pretty sure everyone in the audience there and everyone watching this sees as their first line approach for AF ablation these days. Uh, and the the group here um, from Leipzig went on and did some epicardial uh, approaches to these patients. And, and the, the takeaway message here is that they actually found quite a lot of patients that had a purely epicardial substrate, in this case, 14%, and quite a lot had these unusual bridging fibers into the epicardium, which I think those of us who do a lot of endocardial ablation all probably recognize, you know, we, we see areas, we ablate them, we think that should be helping and terminating a tachycardia, but it's not. And we always sort of say, oh, yeah, there's the ligament of Marshall or some sort of bridging epicardial fiber. Well, these guys very nicely demonstrated it. And what they also nicely demonstrated was with these maps that they could, they could show these areas of low voltage. These are epicardial maps of the atrium here, low voltage areas here, some over towards the right atrium between the SVC and IVC, uh, sometimes little channels uh, through other areas of scar. Um, you know, that they were able to show these very nicely and indeed map and ablate a lot of these patients. Access to the left atrium is a challenge, um, something again you just have to try. We've done it a few times. 
because of the pericardial reflections, there are various ways to get into most of it, but there are a few spots that are very, very difficult to get to, or, or sometimes in some patients impossible. So some of the parts of the anterior wall, um, sometimes right up near the top of the of the roof of the left atrium can be very difficult because there's a fold there. But um, but largely, if you move around, you can move around these folds and get into the spaces. And of course, they did very well with this. I mean, to get almost 70% success rate um, after so many months in, in this particular patient population who, remember, have failed with robust pulmonary vein isolation alone. Um, you know, pretty good, actually, to get around that mark for patients, probably like largely more persistent AF ablation patients. So, yeah, I, I think there is some merit to atrial AF ablation or atrial tachycardia ablation. Very niche, though. I'd say the VT ablation is, is much more mainstream. This, this is pretty niche indication. So I, I'm, I'm going to summarize by saying that uh, VT ablation is challenging, but, but we can be prepared for that and we can know that the endocardial approach won't always be successful and be ready to, to do an epicardial approach and, and have the, the technique and skills to do that. As I mentioned quite near the beginning of, of my talk, and forgive me, I don't mean to be patronizing, I, I went through my learning curve, I'm still on my learning curve, but uh, but you know, I think with the practice, it, you can become very good at this relatively quickly and with low complication rates in, in everyone's hands. I personally think it's probably best done under GA, although I do know some people who do this under sedation. Uh, and I, I do think that in some cases, it, it is worth just putting it in at the beginning, uh, putting the wire into the epicardial space and then carrying on. And, and in some cases, we end up pulling it out. I have to confess, we had a few cases where we've just pulled it out because we've got a really nice result from an endocardial map and ablation, non-inducible. We thought, well, do we need to do the epicardial map? We've actually thought, no, we won't. Let's, let's not do it. Why? It, mapping itself probably not very risky but why do it and certainly not ablate if we don't need to um so we have a low threshold putting in because if you look at the other way if you do a lot of endocardial ablation or you spend two three hours trying with the endocardial approach and then you decide you want to go for an epicardial approach you just don't feel like putting it in i'll be honest it just at that point you're, you're more like to stop and come back so yeah that's why we've taken that approach and there are some pathologies I think that definitely warrant an epicard approach. And, and I would highly recommend if you're ablating patients with ARVC, you really, I, I personally feel you need to have an epicardial map done because there is so much substrate that appears there. Dare I say, even if you manage to get a good result from an endocardial ablation, there's, we have always seen substrate with all our ARVCs that we felt that we do need to target. And I suppose even if they're non-inducible, we will tend to target that just because we know that's a progressive condition is likely to cause trouble in the future. Sarcoid, likewise, hypertrophic chymarvin, kind of, of course, I, I mentioned Brigard, Brigard in a few cases we've done. As I, as I said, atrial epicardial ablation is feasible, but it's less routine. I, I, I wait for that to become more mainstream. It's certainly not mainstream in our practice. I'd be interested to hear whether it's mainstream in anyone's practice in Greece. Um, but but uh, let's let's watch and wait. We're getting reasonable results from endocardial ablation, I suppose, so that hasn't driven the epicardial AF ablation or atrial tachy ablation. Uh, and and finally, you know, I do think that you get lower volume, uh, lower complication rates with increasing volume. So if if you are going to take this on, which I would highly recommend you do as an electrophysiologist, if you're dealing with these sorts of patients and ablating them because it does improve their outcome, their quality of life, mortality as well. Some data on that, the benefit. Then then try and get some volume, get someone to to assist you for your first few cases. It, the learning curve is is steep, but it, it's relatively short. Thank you very much again for inviting me along. It's been a real pleasure being with you. Thank you, Kim. Uh, it was a really an excellent and very informative talk. Um, there is one question from um, uh, Professor Vasilikos, and after I will address you another one. Thank you. Good morning, Kim. It's Good a morning. Pleasure. We don't have you with us here. It's a sunny day. Uh, we hope next year. Uh, I, I'll ask you a very silly question. Uh, would you do an epicardial ablation if you don't have a cardiothoracic unit on site? Would you dare to do it? Um, Vasilis, 
well, first of all, you, you very kindly sent the sun to Oxford. So thank you for that, because it's sunny here, which it normally isn't at this time of September. So thank you. Um, but I would clearly rather be there with you in the sun. Um, yeah, it's not, a, of course, it's not a silly question. It's a great question. We have, I have been to other centres uh, where we've helped them with, uh, with starting their epicardial programmes, and some of them do not have chiothoracic surgery on site. Uh, they do the, the full variety of ablation, including VT ablation already. Uh, they have arrangements for how they might transfer patients if they run into trouble. But the reality is that they don't have them on site. And we've done epicardial approaches in those, in those settings. I, I think this largely comes down to how comfortable you are with managing the potential complications that can occur. Um, I'm going to tempt fate a little here and say that we haven't fortunately at least for this type of relation required our surgeons to help us um we have done a quite a large number we have seen unfortunately we've seen almost all of those complications i described not not coronary artery perforation that's required any any repair though um so i i personally think that it is not i'm sorry about to use two negatives i think it is it is reasonable to consider it I think what you'd want, though, is you'd want an experienced operator, um, at least yeah. helping with the first cases, and, and, a, and, 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 and probably a, a mechanism for backup if needed, even if it means transferring. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. And another question, how often have you found that uh, the isthmus or the substrate you want to ablate is near the coronary arteries and you yeah. can fair the, the, the case? Great question. I, I don't have the exact data. I should have actually pulled that out. But I, I know for a fact that we've had at least two or three in the last 18 months where we've ha actually had to abandon abandon the procedure because it was you know, the, the spot was right on the coronary artery. So it, it does occur. And I think you you, know, you have to be able to make that call. I, I think um, there. I will just mention that we have also ablated pretty close to the coronary artery. I mentioned there's a one centimeter that we try and avoid the main epicardial vessels. We have had a few where we've been probably, let's say, half a centimeter away. And, and we've just very carefully, I think carefully, and everyone's careful, but we've, we've tried carefully to deliver some energy and actually got a good result. I, the, one of the ones I very clearly remember was we had a LB Summit VT uh, about, yeah, probably almost two years ago now that we couldn't get endocardially or from any of the other access routes we went epicardially and it was right next to the left main stem and we just said look you know you, you can't do it. it was a young patient with lots of ve's and vt and we said look we, we just have to manage this medically so you, you sometimes have to do that you're quite right great great thank you very much and thank uh, you for and thank you for the invitation okay thank you Thank you. Um, before passing the microphone to my co-chair, uh, Dr. Zechris, who has a quite considerable experience on uh, epicardial ablation, um, I would like to ask you, uh, I think, a very crucial uh, question. Um, the, the, the problem is that to decide beforehand who is uh, the patient who is very likely to have an epicardial ablation. And this is not only for logistical reasons, it's because we may decide to refer this patient to another center uh, with uh, experience on uh, epicardial ablation. So, according to the literature, there are three tools that we usually use on uh, taking this um, decision. ECG, CMR, and endocardial mapping. So when you plan for a patient with VT, um, uh, whether you are going to go endocardially, epicardially, or both, uh, which tools uh, do you usually use, and uh, what's your 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 view on this uh, uh, on this issue? Yeah, Nikos, this is a really really good point because you you mentioned three criteria there, and of course, um, actually, I, I'm going to say. I don't agree with that totally. Uh, that, that is, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean just very briefly, which, so if you look at ECG, that's great. Um, sometimes the problem is that we don't have an ECG of the VT. You know, if they're, they're hemodynamically unstable and they're getting multiple therapies from their device, all we get is, is the electrograms from their ICD. So, so we don't have the ECG. So we can't immediately determine whether or not it's going to be endocardial or epicardial. Um, in terms of imaging, 
MRI is fantastic. We've got some great CT uh, work that goes on here. And, and some of these guys can sort of look at the scar very nicely with the CT as well, they tell me. Uh, and they'll tell me whether there's, there's scar there. Of course, with the ICD in, sometimes we don't get such a good image for, for it. We get a bit of artifact, even, if, even though they go into the magnet. So again, the MRI can be helpful. If you've got an MRI that clearly shows an epicardial substrate, I think you're definitely going to think, OK, I'm going to have to probably consider that. But again, I'm not sure it's a totally reliable tool because it may not always be available to you or give you helpful information. Um, and, and then finally, I suppose you know, if, if you've done the endocardial mapping already, and you've got to that point and you've decided now you need to go epicardial. As I said, you, you've anticoagulated them possibly if it's left ventricular and you may not want to then go epicardial at that stage or, or if you don't feel comfortable to do it, then it's it's a second procedure for the patient. So our selection has become, as I said, much more, shall we say, rudimentary based on what we think is the, the likelihood uh, from the substrate we're dealing with and from the underlying pathology. So ischemic heart disease definitely will only go endocardial first and to be honest with you if we fail with the endocardial approach we'll probably stop actually and bring them back for the epicardial approach but all most of the non-ischemics uh, unless we've got a 12 ecg of the vt and it looks very septal and we don't think it's likely that the clinical one at least is going to be uh, epicardial and lateral uh, then we'll we'll probably almost all the other ones we will put in a wire at the start now now why do i do that I, there are a few reasons first of all just very quickly because it gives us practice with with the best one in the world it, it gives myself my trainees practice to get epicardial access which which means they get better at it and we've got the skills to do it and secondly because as i said if you've got it there at the beginning you get them all in one go all three access sites arterial venous and epicardial it's it's easy then to move from one to the other rather than having to debate in your mind and sort of keep pushing on with one approach you can just keep moving between all three so i i i get why people have late given those three criteria but i personally i'm not sure that they're the ones that are the most clinically useful to me in ecos <laughs> dr rajapan indeed it was a very fascinating talk it is clear to me that um, you are uh, a very expert uh, electrosurgist in pericardial access, and even bias in a positive way in, in the favor of pericardial access. What I mean, I see that uh, in the whole um, uh, presentation, your uh, approach is electrosurgically oriented rather than imaging uh, uh, oriented, like we see from other uh, VT centers in Europe, you know, in Milan, in Berueso, Jais, Hedrix. And I see that even in your procedures, you don't use, um, uh, uh, you don't merge with uh, imaging, you don't use a coronary CT. I didn't see a phrenic nerve uh, annotation in the in the IMIP mapping, and it is based in, in your great experience. You also mentioned the very inspiring method of John Silberbauer for pericardial access. I don't think that you use it, but I think it's a very nice way for some centers to start and use this inspiring method. We were together with John, and uh, I had, you know, I, 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 I was there in the first cases that he tried to do that. And it is a very nice way for some centers to start. But I would like to ask you, what do you think about the role of cardio insight during a VT case in order to decide for an epicardial procedure, and what do you think will be the future of epicardial procedures in cases like sarcoided hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy, where the scar is in the middle and it is difficult to approach even only maybe only with bipolar ablation, with the use of cardio ablation? Yeah, uh, yeah, nice. Um, so yeah, I, Jonathan's a, a friend and colleague, and I I think it's it's a lovely technique. He he sent us. Uh, his presentation and uh, again just to reiterate for those who don't know about it yeah what what he does is he gets into the coronary sinus very carefully perforates with a with a wire uh, and then insufflates the pericardial space with some co2 and it's and, it, and it's really neat uh, i've i've seen the presentations and it I, I think your point's very well made actually that that's quite a nice way to learn and um, probably gives you a little bit more comfort having a bit more space i, I would i would also say though that we train our trainees without that and 
with very careful sort of training that they they do absolutely fine but i, I do love the idea of using it as a training tool initially um in terms of where i think we're going with epicardial vt ablation as i said before i i think everyone can do it i mean it's easy for me to say that and I'm, it's nice of you to say i'm x but I, I i'm very lucky i got some training early on and i've just been able to we've been able to carry on doing numbers and i think as i said with with increasing numbers we become increasingly expert we do take a very electrophysiological approach also as you said um we do sometimes merge the ct i didn't show that image we tend to map the phrenic nerve rather with just sort of balls as we map the phrenic nerve and again i took those off my maps just to make them look prettier but but it you know it, it's a very electrophysiological approach that we use as you say we're, we're not largely given driven by the cmr as as, as nikos was highlighting you know, some people are and i i respect their really greater experience than mine but we found that actually taking the substrate approach from the electrophysiology has, has given us very very good results uh, for the future Cardio Insight, we have only we have no experience in Oxford with it and some limited experience from our friends and colleagues who definitely think it's excellent. I'd be interested to hear if, if either of you or anyone there has some in, uh, experience with it, particularly with the epicardial work. Your point about the mid-myocardial stuff is very nice because yeah, I, I think that is definitely an area that we need to look at in the future. Bipolar RF, we've done a couple of cases uh, with the CARTO system set up and that's been quite nice in some mid-septal substrate. Um, we've also failed with quite a few of those, I have to be honest, if I look at the numbers um, where we just think we can't get to that substrate. I do. We're looking at the radiotherapy at the moment. And again, I don't know whether any Greece has used the radiotherapy, but we're definitely about to start doing some radiotherapy um, to try and target mid myocardial substrate in particular. Um, and I think that might be the future. But, you know, it's, it's I think the first thing is to get more people comfortable with doing it if i'm honest okay thank you kim uh, again it was a very uh, it was a great pleasure for us to have with you and we hope as uh, professor Vasiliko said next time to be with us and to have some uh, some together eh? and <laughs> we proceed to the